right, so we are going to go ahead and jump into Inclus's problem set 11. Um, and starting with number one, which I have gone over in another video already, and I'll link that in the uh, description of this video, just in case you need that extra help there. Um, but I will go over it just because since it was on the last two homeworks, I imagine it will be on our upcoming exam. Um, so an additional example might help out. So what they want first is we have f of x equals this. We want to find the derivative of f of x um, using two different uh, definitions of our derivative because they want to make sure that we know both of these. Um, so they first want our definition of a derivative from section 3.1 which if you recall, so obviously that the derivative of f of x is the limit as t approaches x of f of t minus f of x over t minus x, right? But they clearly, they want us to plug in values for that and they want us to simplify so that we don't have a complex fraction. And remember that a complex fraction is just a fraction within a fraction so we're still gonna have a fraction like this, but since our f of x has a fraction in it, we're going to want to eliminate um, one of those fraction bars. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this definition with our function here. So remember it's the limit as t approaches x of f of t. So wherever there's an x, I'm gonna plug in a t. So it's gonna be two t plus one over t minus three minus f of x. So two x plus one over x minus three, all over t minus x. And this is why this is a complex fraction because we've got these fractions within this fraction here. Um, so we need to get rid of either both of these fraction bars or this one here um, through reducing and simplifying and whatnot. So, First thing that I always do when I see it set up like this is I combine these fractions here. So I'm going to find a common denominator. And obviously the easiest way for us to do that here is to just multiply our denominators together. So I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as t approaches x of, let's see. I first need to figure out what this term is going to turn into. So remember, and multiplying our denominators together. So in order to figure out what this becomes, it's going to be this times this. So we get 2t plus 1 times x minus 3, and I'm just going to FOIL, so it's going to be 2xt, right, because 2t times x, minus 6t plus x minus 3, okay? And then it's all going to be minus whatever this becomes, which is going to be this times the other denominator. And again, we're just going to FOIL that out. So it's going to be minus 2xt minus 6x plus t minus 3 all over our new denominator, which is just t minus 3 times x minus 3, and still all over t minus x. It's a little ugly now, just because it's big, long fractions. But I see we've got a lot of like terms that we can combine here. So we're first going to distribute that negative, um, just so that we don't lose anything. So I'm actually going to, I see that this is going to be a negative 2x. I'm going to erase that, and I'm just going to have it minus 2x. I know that the negative would cancel out that and make it positive. My plus t turns into a minus, and my minus 3 turns into a plus. Well, now I've got a 2xt minus a 2xt, so I know these cancel. I've got a minus 6t and a minus t, so I know those are going to combine to be a negative 7t, right? I've got an x plus 6x, so that's going to be plus... 7x, and I've got a minus 3 plus a 3, so I know those cancel. And now I can rewrite this. Everything canceled except for our like terms, which we combined there. So now I rewrite this as the limit as t approaches x 
of negative 7t plus 7x over t minus 3, x minus 3, all over t minus x. And we've simplified it a lot, but there is still that complex fraction. So we want to be able to, and I see I can kind of, I can see that I can, I'm going to be able to cancel that out. Sorry, just stumbled over that. And I, I see I'm going to be able to cancel out the t minus x, except for right now it's more of an x minus t, right? Because I've got the negative t and the negative x. So I'm going to factor out a negative 7 from that top there. And let's see what happens. So I factor out a negative 7. It's going to be negative 7 t, and that's going to turn into a negative t minus x over t minus 3, x minus 3 all over t minus x. And because this is in the numerator of this fraction, and it's all being divided by this, I know that these are going to cancel out. So now I'm just left with the limit as t approaches x of negative 7 over t minus 3 times x minus 3. And this is what they want in those parentheses. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and write. So I've got the limit as t approaches x, negative 7, t minus 3, x minus 3. And you might be inclined to just go ahead and plug in that x um, and realize that this is just x minus 3 squared. Um, but if you input that here, that's not going to work because by plugging in that x, you are solving for this and it's no longer the limit of that function so you need to keep it in terms of both t and x um, for this to make sense. The second definition, the one uh, from section 3.2, is that uh, the derivative of our function is the limit of as h approaches 0 of, I'm going to rewrite over here, limit as h approaches 0, excuse me, of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And again, that is the exact definition, um, but that's not what we're going to want to plug in. We want to plug this in first. It says don't simplify, so we are allowed to keep it uh, in terms of a complex fraction. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. Well, if I've got f of x is 2x plus 1 over x minus 3, f of x plus h is wherever I see an x, I plug in an x plus h. So it's going to be 2 x plus h plus 1 over x plus h minus 3. And I could put parentheses there, but since we're just adding and subtracting, that's not critical. Minus uh, f of x, so it's just 2 x plus 1 over x minus 3 all over h. Oh, and you'll see I did accidentally leave out a very important part. I often leave this out when I'm just working algebraically, um, but that's because I've got wrist issues, so writing too much is difficult. Um, but you always want to keep this limit here until you plug in a point. Um, it's only when you plug in that point and are actually solving the limit um, that you can get rid of calling it a limit, because if you do anything otherwise up to that point, it's technically wrong. <laughs> So just be very careful. And this is exactly what they're looking for in here. Um, and I'm not going to rewrite that. You can see it right over here. Um, and if we were to use the quotient rule, we would see, and well, if we were to simplify this and eventually plug in that zero um, and plug in this x for this one, we would get the same answer for both of these. They would both result in the same derivative, um, a derivative you can also get by using our quotient rule, which is a little bit of a shortcut, but also pretty long. Um, and in this case, we can actually see it pretty clearly that our derivative is going to be a negative 7, and there's no x in that numerator. And if I was to plug in the x there, I get x minus 3 times x minus 3, which is just x minus 3 squared. And that's all they're looking for. Remember, there's no x, so that's a 0 times x. It is a negative 7. All right, number 2 is another uh, derivative. This one we are not going to be using limits. We're going to use some of our shortcuts. We're going to use chain rule in particular for this one. Um, oops, <laughs> pressed a button, didn't mean to. So it says that y equals 6 times the natural log of sine of e to the power of 2t. 
So I see a lot of insides and a lot of outsides here. We want to find the derivative of this whole function because we want what dy dt is uh, with respect to t, which is good because our actual variable is already a t. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and set this up. I see my first outside is the 6 times natural log of my inside. Okay. My next, my inside there is another outside. It is sine of another inside. My next inside is another outside because I've got more than just a single variable in uh, the exponent. So it's e to the power of our last inside, and it is our last inside, it is 2t. Okay, now I'm going to kind of work my way down and then plug everything back in. So I'm going to take the derivative of u, but in terms of v, before I plug things back in, oops, didn't mean to hit that. So I know, of, of course, that the derivative of natural log is 1 over x. Um, in this case, our x is a v, and we've got a 6 multiplied by that, so it's going to be 6 over v. Um, but because it's chain rule, remember we have to do 6 over v times the derivative of our inside. So I'm just going to put that right up there. Then when we take the derivative of our inside, I know the derivative of sine is cosine. And again, chain rule, so we're going to multiply that by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of e to the power of something is just itself, but with our chain rule, we also have to multiply by the derivative of the inside once again. And then finally, take the derivative of our last inside, the derivative of 2t is just 2. So now I can go back, I see that the derivative of c is going to be e to the l, which is 2t times 2. The derivative of v is going to be this bit right here, so 2e to the 2t times cosine of whatever c was, c was e to the 2t, and then I take this and I plug it all in for my derivative of v, so this is all going to be, it's going to be 6 times, well times 2, so I'm going to just combine that, it's going to be 12e to the 2t times cosine e to the 2t all over what is v, v is sine of e to the 2t, okay? And I incorporated that 6 in there for our convenience because it doesn't change anything. So this is actually the derivative of our entire function, right, because there's no other aspects to it. So I'm going to rewrite that down here. We just got that dy dt uh, is equal to 12 e to the 2t times cosine e to the 2t all over sine of e to the 2t. This technically isn't in the terms that they have it written here, right? Because we have this bit written outside of the fraction line, but that is the same thing, right? Because when we're multiplying, um, it doesn't matter that fraction line is there because it's just going to multiply with our numerator, right? Because we multiply straight across, it's the same as that over 1. So we see that a is going to be 12. B is obviously 2, cosine to the power of 1, and sine also to the power of 1. That's all there is to that. Um, our next one's a bit trickier. So it says a rope is attached to the front of a boat coming in. Okay, so we've got our boat. I'm going to draw it like this. Maybe it's a little it's a sailboat. <laughs> um, maybe that's the back. I don't know boats. <laughs> That's not important. We'll say that it's coming into this dock here. Ba -da -ba. No need to be an artist here. It says rope is attached to the front of a boat coming in, so we'll attach it right up there. If the rope is drawn in over a pulley eight feet higher than the boat, okay, so this is eight feet. It's drawn in at a rate of five feet per second. I'll say I got a person here holding it. It's a tall person. Don't mind that. <laughs> How fast is the boat docking when the length of the rope from the boat is 17 feet? So we're saying that this length is 17 feet. 
um, and that the rate at which this rope is being pulled in is five feet per second, which means that this right here is shrinking at five feet per second, right? Um, and we want to know how fast the boat is docking, so how quickly it's moving this way. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to represent this. I'm going to say that my, uh, we'll call this D equals 17 feet. I'll call this Y, is there 8 feet, and X is something. I actually recognize from my special right triangles, right? This is one of our Pythagorean triples. We've got an 8, 15, 17 triangle, I believe, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, we're told that the rate at which that distance is changing, right? So this rope is being pulled in at a rate of five feet per second. So this is getting shorter by five feet per second. So I'm going to make sure to make that negative. We're looking for the rate at which this is changing. So we're looking for dx dt. And the rate at which this y value is changing, well, this is a uh, pulley. This is a thing right here. That does not change in height, right? It's the solid bar that you're pulling um, the rope over. So our dy dt equals zero. It has no rate of change. It's not going to change at any point. It stays the same height. It is constant. So if we just redraw that triangle up here, we've got y equals 8, dy dt equals 0. I'm just going to write it all a little bit neater. x equals 15 at this point. You can always double check that with our Pythagorean theorem because it is a right triangle that forms. Um, x dt is what we're looking for. We're using d to represent our distance. And d, d dt is a negative 5. Oops. I don't know why it erase like that. Okay, so I know in this case that x squared plus y squared equals this right here, right? And we know x, y, and d at this point. Um, remember that I solved for x. I happen to recognize that this is a Pythagorean triple, but I could have solved for it this exact way, um, which means that if I want to know what dx dt is, I'm going to have to take the derivative of this. Um, so I'm going to do so implicitly. So I'm going to get 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 2d d d dt. And I see that everything is multiplied by 2, so I can actually cancel out all of these because it's 2 on each side. So that turns into x dx dt plus y dy dt equals d D, 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 T. And now I just plug in everything that I know, right? So I know that this is a 15 dx dt plus an 8 times a 0, so it's just going to turn to 0, equals 17 times negative 5, which means that 15 dx dt equals whatever negative 5 times 17 is. Oops. Oops. Can't write. Okay. Which means that dx dt is going to be negative 5 times 17 over 15. Or these cancel a little bit, so actually it's just negative 17 over 3. Remember that's feet per second. So it's moving at a rate of negative 17 thirds feet per second. Um, and it sounds like they're actually just asking for speed and not velocity. So you might omit um, that negative there because it's moving towards the dock at a rate of this, right? Um, but that does mean that the uh, bit right there is decreasing, that distance is decreasing, uh, but that is the rate. Let's see, number four, we're using linear approximation. 
You want to find something that approximates this right here. Well, um, as it first sets up, the function for this linear approximation is given by f of x equals x to the power of d, where d equals what? Well, I know f of x is going to be the square root of x in this case, right? Um, and the square root of x is the same as x to the 1 half. So d equals 1 half, or I could write 0.5, uh, what have you. Now, using this as our f of x, and I'm actually just going to uh, keep it with the square root, personally. Or actually, for the derivative, it's good to use the uh, power rule. So then, we know our derivative of f of x is going to be well, I put a 1 half in front, then I subtract 1, um, so this turns into 1 half times uh, 1 over the square root of x, or just 1 over 2 square roots of x. Okay, so we know right here this is our equation for linear approximation. So I want a value that's going to be pretty close to that for my x. I'm going to use a whole number value because using a decimal uh, kind of defeats the purpose of using linear approximation to begin with. Um, so what's the square root of something that I know is going to be close to this? Well, I recognize that this is really close to 169. Um, and 169 is the square of 13, right? So if I use 169 as my a, that's going to get me the square root of 169, because that's my f of a. So it's going to be a 13 plus, plug in now that a to my f prime. So I'm getting 1 over 2 times 13, which is 1 over 26, times h. Um, and h, when we are doing our linear approximation, is um, x minus a. So our x, in this case, is 168.4, and our a is 169, so it's a difference of negative 0.6. And that's going to equal c. So I know our h, we just found, is a negative 0.6. And that C is going to be whatever this uh, equates to. So negative 0.6 is the same as negative 6 tenths, or negative 3 fifths if I reduce that. So let's see, 1 26th times negative 3 fifths. That gets pretty ugly pretty quickly, but I think that that's negative 3 over, what is that, 130? 20 times 5 is 166 times, yeah. Okay, so it's 13, um, and I'm going to keep that in fractional form. Oh, that's a negative, so it's actually going to be subtracting, and that's going to be that, because um, that would be 13 plus that right there. So if I'm going to keep it as a mixed number, I've got to do that. Um, and I am, I'm just going to leave it like that, uh, but I would plug that into a calculator for the homework uh, to get the decimal value that they want. Or do that division yourself, but I don't feel like it right now. Uh, this next one is the same deal, except now um, our d is going to be one third, which means that this is a cube root. Right, so f of x equals cube root of x equals x to the one third which means that f prime of x is going to be, again, we're going to put that one third in front, subtract one, so we get negative two thirds, which means that this is going to be one over three times the cube root of x squared. Okay? And that's exactly what this is. I just rewrote it um, in a way that I prefer to read it, personally. And... Well, a cube root that's really close to 64, or a cube that's really close to 64 that I know of. Oh, I just said it twice. A cube that I know is really close to 63.5 is 64. So let's say a is 64. That means that f of a equals the cube root of 64 equals 4. 
and f prime of a equals 1 over 3 times the cube root of 64 squared, which is going to be 1 over 3 times 4 squared, which is 1 over 3 times 16, or 1 over 48. Remember, x, uh, h is x minus a, so it's going to be this, like that, so our h is going to be a negative 0.5. And now we evaluate C. So we get 4 plus um, negative 1 half times 1 over 48. I just switched those around for my own sake. But this is obviously that. And this is obviously H. Um, which gets me 4 minus 1 over 96. Which is 3 and 95 96. Alright. Moving down the line, sorry about that. Moving down the line, we've got number six here. So again, using that linear approximation, um, and this time they give us our f of x. f of x is sine, which means that f prime of x is the derivative of sine of x, or just cosine of x. Um, in this case, we want to figure out an x value really close to 6 pi over 13, um, and something that's really close to that is going to be 6 pi over 12, right? That is a one-digit difference in... Uh, the denominator, and this simplifies, it reduces to pi over 2. So we're going to use pi over 2 for our a. I know that f of pi over 2 is going to be sine at pi over 2. So our f of a sine of pi over 2 is 1. Our f prime of a equals 0. Um, again, our h is our x minus a. So I've got 6 pi over 13 minus 6 pi over 12. Um, or I suppose since it's pi over 2, it'd be 6.5 pi over 13. That's another way I could write that, which means that our h is going to be a negative 1 half pi over 13, or a negative pi over 26 is how I could write that. Again, for actually inputting that to the homework, I think you might have to use a calculator for those decimals. Um, but yeah, since our f prime of a is 0, even multiplying it by our h doesn't do anything. So our c happens to just be f prime of a, so our approximation in this case is 1. Obviously, that doesn't get us super close. Well, I mean, it gets us pretty close, obviously, because this is really close to pi over 2. But it doesn't get us... Um, our exact answer, obviously, because they're clearly going to be very different. All right, number seven. This is a trickier one. Getting into some related rates now. I, I suppose we did one earlier, but it says a UFO flies parallel to the ground at an altitude of three quarters kilometers and a speed of four kilometers per minute. If the UFO passes directly over a farmer's house, at what rate is the distance between the UFO and the house changing two minutes after it flies over? So first thing I recommend doing, I always recommend drawing these out. So I'm going to draw out my little UFO right up here. Little UFO. Pow, pow. Uh, it's not the prettiest of UFOs, but there we go. It's got a little dude inside of it. Okay. So I know that it is parallel to the ground at a height of three quarters kilometers. Um, he flies over a farmer's house, um, and we'll call this point, we'll say this is a coordinate zero, zero, and he's moving on at a velocity of four kilometers per minute. So, we want to find, I could redraw this, it's a little bit of a triangle. We want to find the distance 
um, or the rate of change for the distance d um, at a particular point. First of all, um, we want to figure out what our values are at this point. Obviously, this is our velocity, so that's not the actual position of our UFO. Uh, remember, the starting position is, that's our x is our 0, and it's 3 quarter kilometers above the ground, and it's moving rightward at a speed of 4. So the first thing I want to do is figure out exactly um, how far over my UFO has moved um, at that two minute point. So um, if it's moving at a rate of four kilometers per minute, then after two minutes pass, it will be, it will have gone eight kilometers, right? So it goes from this right here to I said eight kilometers and it's still at a height of three fourths. Um, and here's our zero zero point. So what that tells me is that he's moved right eight. So I'll call this our X, our Y and our D um, at the point that we're considering X equals eight, Y equals three fourths and D we can find using our Pythagorean theorem X squared plus Y squared equals D squared. Eight squared is 64. 3 quarters squared is 9 sixteenths. If I add those together, um, well, it's going to equal d squared. So d is going to be the square root of 64 and 9 sixteenths. All right, we know the rate of change of the x value, right? Because they told us that velocity, so dx dt equals 4, because it's at 4 kilometers per minute. And we know that the height, the altitude of our UFO never changes. It's at a constant altitude of 3 fourths. So dy dt equals 0. And we're looking for dd dt when uh, t equals 2, so at that particular point. So now I take my x squared plus y squared equals d squared, and I take the derivative, just like we did earlier. So I get 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 2d d d dt. And again, these twos all cancel out, so I'm going to rewrite that like so, just so that I don't have any accidental multiplication errors. Oops. Okay. Now the thing that we're looking for is d, 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 t, and everything else we already know the values of. I know x equals 8 at this point, so it's going to be 8 times the change of x is 4, plus y is 3 quarters, and the rate of change of y is 0. d is that square root, and boom. I know that 3 quarters times 0 is just 0, so I'm going to ignore that term now because it's nothing. Right, 8 times 4 is 32, so 32 plus this, oops, times this square root here. So our rate of change of the distance at this point is going to be 32 divided by 60, square root of 64 and 9 sixteenths. Um, you can obviously plug that into a calculator if you like, um, or do any or rationalize that even. Um, I'm not going to, but you are welcome to. That is our answer. I believe that should be correct. Um, I'm going to erase all of that now just so that we've got enough space for our next question because there's a lot of drawing that happens with this one as well. So it's another rate of change or uh, related rates. It says when a rocket is 12 kilometers high, it's moving vertically upward, well, that's redundant, at a speed of 75 kilometers an hour. At that instant, how fast is the angle of elevation of the rocket increasing, as seen by an observer on the ground three kilometers from the launching pad? Okay, so there's a lot happening there, which is why I recommend drawing it out. So we've got our launching pad, right? We've got our little launching pad. Our rocket launched. They went up there. 
Let's draw a little rocket. It's a sloppy little rocket, but that's okay. Um, so this is our rocket, and our rocket is currently um, 12 kilometers high, right? And it's moving upward at a rate of 75 kilometers an hour. If there's someone who is three kilometers from the launch pad, we want to know at what rate is this angle theta changing. So I'm going to call this x and this is y. Um, and we don't really need this distance here. I don't believe, don't, I don't remember. I don't think we need it. Um, instead, I know that my dy dt is this velocity here. So I know y equals 12, dy dt equals 75. The, the person isn't moving any closer or further from the launching pad. So x equals 3 and dx dt is 0 because there's no change across that x-axis there. Um, and so what we're looking for is the ch rate of change of theta. So it would, of course, help us to find theta, but what we want is the rate of change of theta over time. So I can begin by saying that I, I know that theta, I could write that as is the tangent, or is the inverse tangent rather, of, well, got my sine over my cosine. And I'm going to write that as y over x, right? Because we know that we're going to be taking a derivative, so we don't want to plug in the values we know yet because we're talking at a particular point. Um, and then if I take the derivative of this, or I could rewrite that as um, tangent of theta equals y over x, which is probably preferred because I don't think we've done anything with the derivative of inverse um, trig functions yet. Um, I have touched on those in my uh, video on derivative rules, but I don't think we need to work with that today. There's a lot more room for error uh, doing that. So the tangent of theta equals y over x, and I know I could write that theta at this point is going to equal the inverse tangent of 12 over 3, which is 4. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take this derivative. And I know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared, right? Um, but remember, this is with respect to t, so we've got to use chain rule because our variable inside is not a t. So what's going to happen is, well, the derivative of theta is going to be 1, but with respect to t, it's going to be 1 times d theta dt. So we're going to get d theta dt on the outside times secant squared, because that's the derivative of our outside, of theta equals... Now I've got to take the derivative of y over x, um, and I'm actually going to rewrite this. I'm going to do this using the product rule. You definitely could use quotient rule here, but I'm going to rewrite y over x as y times x to the negative first. Using my product rule, I will get y times x to the, or sorry, negative, because I'm going to put that negative down, times y times x to the negative 2, which will be like that, plus, oh, and I forgot the dx dt there, all times that, plus, now it's going to be 1 over x times dy dt, because the derivative of y is just 1 times dy dt. So I'm going to rewrite that on now, get it negative y over x squared dx dt plus 1 over x dy dt. And all I have to do now 
is plug things in. Um, yeah. So let's see. So we know that I'm going to simplify this actually because I just want, I want this isolated. So it's going to be all of this divided by that. Um, I know that y is 12, x is 3, so it's going to be a negative 12 over 9. Negative 12 over 9 times dx dt, which is 0. So it's actually all going to be 0 there. So it's going to be 0 plus 1 over x. So it's going to be 1 third times dy dt, which is 75, which put those together, it's 75 divided by 3, or just 25 all over secant squared of theta. And we know that theta equals the arctangent of four. And if I were to go ahead and plug that into my calculator, I would have the exact value at that point. Um, but I'm just gonna write that as gonna be d theta dt is 25 over secant squared of the arctangent of four is how I'm going to write that for right now. Again, feel free to plug that into your calculator. That should be correct. There's a chance that I've made a mistake, obviously, um, as always, as I am just a student. Um, and even our teachers make plenty of mistakes, but I believe that should be right. So, yes. Okay. Okay, let's move on to number nine, which is, I was about to say it's my personal least favorite, but number 10 actually is, I believe. So, but they're both a little complicated and a little confusing to draw. So we'll take it slow. It says a lighthouse at point L, okay, so we've got point L, is located on a small island from the nearest point P on a straight shoreline. So a straight shoreline, it says, nearest point P is going to be a straight line, of course. Um, I'm just going to draw that whole shoreline, actually. Okay. Its light makes three revolutions per minute. So the actual rotation of our lighthouse rotates three times a minute, um, which means that every minute it goes six pi. Right, because one revolution would be 2 pi. Um, it says, let A be the point where the beam of light strikes on the shore. Okay, so let's say our beam of light strikes about there. Actually, I'll draw a higher triangle. So say it strikes about there. This is A. Okay. And X, the angle ALP. So it's going to be right in here is that angle. We want to write the distance d from a to p as a function of x. So I want to figure out what this dist distance is based on whatever x is, right? So remember that this goes the full 360 degrees three times every minute. Um, so... That means that the rate of change of x, I believe, should be um, should be six pi. So let's see. We know that this is eight hundred meters because they told us that up here. I think I I don't think I said that out loud. Um, might have skipped over it, but it's eight hundred meters apart. Um, so I know that my x at any point is going to equal the tangent of d over 800. But we want this to be a function of d. So I know that um, oh, sorry, that would be the inverse tangent. So I know that tangent of d over 800 Sorry, 
the tangent of x equals d over 800. I don't know why I slipped up there, which means that d, um, or in this case d of x, is going to be tangent of x times 800, or 800 times tangent of x. Now it says, how fast is the beam of light moving along the shore when the shoreline when it's 600 meters from P? So that's when D equals 600. Okay. So we're looking for how fast is the beam of light moving. So we're looking for how quickly it's moving along that shore there. So the rate of change of that distance. Well, we know that d of x is 800 times tangent of x. So if I take that derivative, I'm going to get my constant coefficient, 800 times, that's going to be, the derivative is secant squared of x times the x dt, because our chain rule, remember, because that x is not the term that we're using. We're taking the derivative of, with respect to t, so we end up with a dx dt on the outside. Um, and because the light makes three revolutions per minute, the rate of change of that x is 6 pi, right? So dx dt equals 6 pi, which means if we plug that in, we get dd dt equals 800 times secant squared of x, and x in this case is again we said that it would be the inverse tangent of that so it'd be the inverse tangent of 600 over 800 or 6 over 8 or 3 fourths so maybe I could write that um, times the x dt which is 6 pi um, interesting I'm gonna double check this actually because I feel like I might have made a teensy tiny mistake no 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 mistakes I yeah so that is our answer I would use a calculator to <laughs> once again I would use a calculator to plug that back in um, or to plug all of that in so you get a decimal answer um, not sure how to simplify this any further really other than maybe combining the 6 pi and the 800 so I'm just gonna leave it like this um, so that would be our answer over in here and that is the answer I hope that <laughs> I hope that, that makes sense um, this next problem, personally, uh, hate with every fiber of my being, but it says a spotlight on the ground shines on a wall a hundred feet away. Okay, so we've got a spotlight, maybe it's down here, it's shining on a wall a hundred feet away. Okay, so a hundred feet is that distance. A man six feet tall. walks away from the spotlight toward the building. Write the height of the shadow S, so whatever his shadow becomes, um, as a function of the distance D from the man to the building. So that would be D at any given point. Um, so the first thing that we need to do here, let's see, is we recognize that at any point we've got this angle of elevation here. So I'm going to redraw this kind of with a tr clearer triangle. We've got theta, um, we've got the dude's height, which is going to be six feet. This is where he is standing. Okay, um, and he is some distance away from the spotlight, right? Um, and his actual distance away from, and so his distance from the spotlight can always be represented 
um, by the overall distance, which is 100 feet, minus his distance from the wall, which we're using D to represent. Um, so I'm going to come up with uh, just any distance. We're going to use, just cut it in half. We'll say he's 50 feet away, right? Um, so in order to figure out what this theta value is, well, I know that tangent of theta equals um, this height, right, divided by um, all of that. So I would say that that is, uh, in this case, that would be 6 over 50 or 6 over uh, 100 minus d. Um, I'm going to write that just like that. We know that, just kind of by using common sense, that when he is 0 feet away from the wall, right, if he's pressed up right against the wall, that the height of his shadow is just going to be his height, right, if we just kind of think about how shadows work. So I know that when s equals 0, right, when the distance is 0, the height of the shadow is going to be 6 feet which means that we've got this triangle here where that's going to be 6 feet and that's going to be 100 feet across. Um, and again, our tangent of theta um, is going to be 6 over um, 100 minus d. And in this case, that doesn't really work for us, right, because if d is 0, we end up with nothing in the denominator, which kind of makes sense. Um, but then continuing on, if we use that, um, it also kind of shows us that um, that is tangent of theta equals our height. Right, so S over that. Um, and I misspoke, actually. Um, obviously, D at this point is 0, so that that makes sense. Um, if D is all the way over here, D would be 100. And it, obviously, there is, it makes more sense for there to not really be any height of the shadow if he's directly in front of the spotlight, right? That's what I meant to say earlier. Um, so again, this is the same as our, like our height of the shadow equals this here. Um, so then we work with that to isolate that height, right? So in this case, that's just going to be 100. So 100 times theta is going to equal that s, or 100 times tangent of theta, rather, um, which means that s equals 100 times, and our tangent of theta, remember, was um, his height, so 6 over 100 minus d, right, which gets us just 600 over 100 minus d, okay, and of course, if we plug in when d equals 0, that makes sense. S of 0 equals 600 over 100, which means his height, shadow height would be 6 feet. That makes sense, right? So we've just determined that S of D is going to be 600 divided by 100 minus the distance there. And then it says, at that instant, the man is 20 feet from the building. He's walking at a speed of 4 feet per second. How fast is the shadow changing? So we're looking for the derivative of the shadow's height um, at the given point. So if we have s of d equals 600 over 100 minus d, we take that derivative, right? Um, and we would use, we can use quotient rule here. So low d high minus high d low. Over low, low. I'm going to pull out the 600 because it is a constant coefficient. So I'm going to get 100 minus d times the derivative of the top, which is 1, which is just 0, minus 
the top, which is 1, times the derivative of the bottom, which is going to be negative 1, over the bottom squared, right? Which gets us 600 times, and that's going to be just 1, because these negatives cancel out over 100 minus d squared. So ds dt equals 600 over 100 minus d. Oh, and I messed up because I forgot that this is all with respect to t. So we took the derivative of that d, which means there's also a um, d d dt in here, right? Because the derivative of that variable d with respect to t. So it's going to be, again, times that. We cannot leave that out. That is critical. Um, and it says that he's 20 feet from the building. So d is 20. So d equals 20. And he's moving at a speed of 4 feet per second. So dd dt is uh, 4. Four, I believe. No, it's a negative four because he's walking towards the building, right? So that distance um, from the building is going to be decreasing, so it's negative. And if I plug those in, I get ds dt at this point equals 600 times negative four over 100 minus um, 20 squared. So you see 100 minus 20 is 80. 80 squared is 6,400. 600 times negative 4 is negative 2,400. So this is going to be negative 2,400 over 6,400. Or negative 24 over 64. Negative 12 over 32. Negative 6 over 16. Negative 3 over Eight. So he's moving. The, the shadow is changing at a rate of negative three eight um, feet per second. I know that was a pretty confusing one. To be completely honest, I'm not sure that I fully understand it myself. Um, so definitely take all of that with a grain of salt. Um, but I hope that that made some sense, especially uh, despite my stumbling <laughs> over words with that one. All right, I'm going to delete this so that we've got plenty of space for any more writing for the next ones. So in this next one, we want to use the newton raphson method, um, which remember the newton raphson method tells us this. Okay, and it's used for approximating the zeros of a function. So in this case, they give us this function here, and they tell us that our first value, so c1, or so I used x's in this case, but you can also write the exact same thing, right? Blah, 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 with c's. Of course, it just it doesn't really matter what variable we use. So they're telling us that c1, or in my case, x1 equals 1. So we want to figure out what x2 would equal. Well, x1 is 1 minus f of x when x equals 1. So this function, plug in a 1, so it's going to be 2 times 1, which is 2, plus 3 times 1, which is 3, minus 2, which is just 3. And forgot to write our derivative. If f of x equals this function, our derivative is going to be 6x squared plus 3. So plugging in a 1 for that, I'm going to get 6 plus 3 is 9, which is 1 minus 1 third. So our x2 in this case is 2 thirds, which is a nice, convenient, uh, easy fraction. Now it says use the method until successive approximations obtained by a calculator are identical. So what we're going to do is we are going to do this entire process in our calculator. Um, 
until we get two results in a row that are the same. So I'm first going to go, okay, I'm going to say that one is my answer in my calculator. I'm going to do that minus, um, let's see, it's got that first function, so it's two times that cubed plus three times that minus two divided by our derivative was six times that squared plus three. Um, and of course, I just did what we did to get our second value, which we get two thirds for. But now I'm going to do the exact same thing for our next value, which gets us about, it's going to, my calculator goes all the way out to here. And if I do it again, I get this. The next one is this. And obviously, these are pretty close to one another, but none of them are identical yet. I haven't gotten any identical results. That one's really, really close. I think the next one might be it. And the next one is it. So the next time I put it in the calculator, I get the exact same thing that I got here. These two are equal. Therefore, that is our approximation. Now to do the exact same thing for number 12. Um, so in this case, it says e to the 2x equals negative x. Um, so I'm going to, since we're approximating zero, I'm just going to add x to both sides, so that equals zero, which means our f of x equals either 2x plus x, which means our f prime of x is going to equal 2 either 2x plus 1, right? Remember, newton raphson method tells us this. So we are going to start off with, we could either start off with um, our first value being zero or negative one. Either one would be a decent estimate. I'm going to use, um, we need zero actually. So I'm going to say that x1 equals zero, which means x2 is going to be, and I'm going to go ahead and start typing this into my calculator. So start off with zero. So I'm going to do that minus my first function is e to the 2x plus x. And that's going to be divided by 2 times e to the 2x plus 1. So my x2 gets to be about negative 1 third. x3 going to be about this. Do it again. And again, because again, we want to get them to a point where we get two results that are identical out to the digits that our calculator shows us. Because that's going to be really, really close estimate when we do that. And there we go. This is it. Since these two are identical, that is our answer. Okay. Now, for our final question, this one's a pretty tricky one, and it took me a little while to 
really understand how to solve it. But it says we have a hemispherical dome. So we've got a little dome. Looks like that. Roughly. So it was, there we go. It's got a hemispherical dome of a radius 30 feet. And it is to be given four coats of paint, each of which is 1 50th of an inch thick. And we want to use linear approximation to estimate the volume of paint needed for the job. Um, so there's two methods that I understand for how to do this, one of which uses linear approximation, the other doesn't. So I'm going to go over the one, the one that uses linear approximation because that's what the question asks us for. Uh, we know that with linear approximation, we know f of x is approximately f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, right? So in this case, our f of x is going to be our volume, our equation for volume, um, because the difference in our volumes is going to tell us exactly how much paint we need, right? Because we need a particular volume of paint. So it's going to be turning from a hemisphere like this to a hemisphere like this, and we want to figure out what this difference is, right? So our volume for a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, but since this is a hemisphere, we're going to cut that in half, so it's going to be 2 thirds pi r cubed, which means that our f prime is going to be 2 pi r squared, okay? So in this case, we are trying to approximate about whatever this is going to be. So our act, or x, or the exact value that we're trying to find the volume of, is going to be the new found radius afterwards, right? So if it is four coats of paint, and each one is 1 50th of an inch thick, well, first we need to turn this into feet, right? So 1 50th of an inch uh, is how many feet? Well, 1 inch is 1 12th of a foot, so 1 50th of an inch is going to be 1 50th times 1 12th, which is, well, that would be, it's going to be 1 over 600, I believe. So 1 50th of an inch, I think, is 1 600th of a foot. Okay. And we want four coats of that, so it's going to be four six hundredths, or two three hundredths, or one one fiftieth of a foot, which means that our new found radius is going to be 30, so our x in this case, our newfound radius is going to be 30 and 1 150th. There we go. Whereas our a is going to be our original radius, right? Because we want to find the difference between those two volumes. So our a is going to be our original radius of 30 feet. And now we just have to plug in, right? So f of 30 and 1 150th. Uh, is approximately equal to, let's see, plug in a 30 into here, 30 cubed. Well, I know 30 squared is 900. 30 cubed is going to be 27,000, I think. Yeah. Yep, it's going to be 27,000. So it's going to be 27,000 divided by 3, so it's going to be actually a 9,000 times 2, so it's an 18,000 times pi. So it's going to be 18,000 pi plus, and I plug in for f prime, we know 30 squared is 900, so it's 2 times 900, which is 1,800 pi times x minus a, 30 and 1 150th minus 30 is just going to be 1 150th. Um, and if I combine that a little bit, basically since we're multiplying, you just multiply straight across. I know that that's the same as 
this. And I know I can divide both of these by 3. 180 divided by 3 is 60. Now I can divide both of these by 5. 60 divided by 5 is 12. So this turns out to be 12 pi. So if I rewrite this, 12 pi. And what I find is this right here. Oops, please don't erase that because it's lacking. Oh, and it did it. Okay. Can it undo it? And this right here is not our final answer. And the reason that's not, not our final answer is because this is an approximation of the new volume altogether, right? That's going to be the approximation of that new volume. What we're trying to find, though, is the difference between those two volumes. So the original volume is exactly this, right? Because we took our original radius and plugged it into the original volume equation. So this is our original volume. And this is going to be the approximate difference, which means that our answer is... 12 pi. Another way we could have done this, um, although I, this is how they wanted us to do it for this one with our linear approximation, another way we could have done this is I know that V in this case, because it's a hemisphere, is going to be 2 thirds pi r cubed, and I could take the derivative of V, which is going to give me 2 pi r squared times dr, right? Um, and the derivative of r is typically just 1, but in this case, we have a value for dr, because that's the change of the radius. We found that the change in the radius was 1 150th of a foot. And we know that r equals 30. So if I plug that in, the change here, it's going to be 2 pi times 900 times 1 150th, which is... 1800 pi over 150, which we just found was 12 pi. Um, and this method is obviously a lot faster, and this one personally makes more sense to me. Um, but since the question did ask for a linear approximation, I did I wanted to go over that first. Um, but either way, the answer in this case should be 12 pi cubic feet. All right, and that is it. That is everything for this one and I hope that I hope that that all made sense um, once again oops <laughs> once again thank you for watching Google is your friend Khan Academy is your friend uh, your friends are your friend um, yeah thank you <laughs>